Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Command Valley. Here with me, I have Landon. Hey, guys. And you're listening to the Core 21 set review. So just a quick reminder before we begin, please remember to like and subscribe. We appreciate all of our subscribers and everyone who has supported us to this point, and we invite you to join on the bandwagon and continue supporting us as we get bigger. Another reminder that this episode and this podcast is brought to you by Game Grid Lehigh. If you are in the Utah County area, please check them out. They have an amazing staff, awesome card selection, D&D accessories, board games, and tons of card accessories. All right, so if you guys haven't joined on one of our set reviews before, let me go ahead and describe how we do it. We don't go over every single card. We're only going to go over the cards that we think are relevant in Commander or have a conversation uh, that deserves to be said. We're just going to be taking turns uh, going back and forth talking about each card that we like. That way we can keep it basically to a minimum. We don't want to spend three hours talking about this set. We only want to be covering the most relevant things for a more casual Commander environment. So with that, I'll, I'll start us off talking about Bastry Ket, the Planeswalker. He costs one white white and he enters with three loyalty counters. He has a plus one ability that says put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature. It gains indestructible until end of turn. His minus two says whenever one or more non-token creatures attack this turn, create that many one one white soldier creature tokens that are tapped and attacking. And his minus six says you get an emblem with at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a one one white soldier creature token, then put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. I feel like this is a super good planeswalker in like the decks that want it and the decks that can abuse either plus one plus one counters or uh the specific white soldier not human creature token such as winota decks one of our friends has a winota deck and it's absolutely brutal um if you're not familiar with winota whenever a non-human attacks you can dig six cards deep in your library and put a, a human into play tapped and attacking with indestructible so bastard cat essentially makes tokens that can trigger winota a lot and even still, his minus two, being able to make a bunch of tokens uh, tapped and attacking is also super useful. I, I, like I said, I think he is in a, I don't think he's an auto include in white decks, but like in a deck that is going to be attacking a lot and is super creature heavy, I think he's a pretty good insert. Moving on, we have Chandra, Heart of Fire, three red red for a five loyalty planeswalker. First plus one, discard your hand, then exile the top three cards of your library until end of turn, you may play cards exiled this way. Another plus one, Chandra Heart of Fire deals two damage to any target. And minus nine for the ultimate, search your graveyard and library for any number of red instant and or sorcery cards. Exile them, then shuffle your library. You may cast them this turn at six red mana. So off the bat, this does seem like a card that's more pushed for one-on-one -on -one limited play. However, if you are in a deck that is designed to want to discard cards or cast instants and sorceries, then this can be of great use to you. So a couple ones that I was thinking of is Riel the Everwise that came out in Ikoria who wants you to dis discard cards. If you have Chandra in that deck, you can essentially discard your hand, draw that many cards, then exile the top three cards of your library. That does seem very good. If you're playing a Mizzix or Riku deck that does care about instants and sorceries, this might be an include that you can get if you really want to get to that ultimate. However, I don't think that you're gonna get to that ultimate very quickly and and people are going to see it coming so in decks where you can use it i think it's pretty good but i wouldn't say that this goes in every red deck next up we have chromatic orrery which is a legendary artifact that costs seven generic mana and it reads you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color it also has an activated ability that says tap add five generic mana to your mana pool it then has another activated ability that says pay five generic mana tap draw a card for each color among permanents you control I think that this card is amazing in the decks that want it, and I don't think that this card is an auto-include as ramp in every single commander deck like I think a lot of people might be thinking. You don't really want to be ramping on turns 5 to 7. On turns 5 to 7, you kind of want to be either ending the game or stopping somebody else from ending the game or basically abusing your value engines. You don't want to be ramping at that point. However, I think that this card belongs in 5-color decks as super great mana fixing because it basically turns all of your lands into command towers and it turns all of your mana rocks into commander spheres which is super useful if you're on a budget and you can't afford all the expensive dual lands i also think that this card is super good in artifact decks that have like affinity so that lets you uh play this card super early on also i like that at when you cast this spell you can also use the mana from the spell to cast a couple more spells during the same turn or you can cast your commander and i also like that Five mana is also a lot if you have an expensive commander at the end, towards the end of the game because of the commander tax, 
or if you just have an expensive commander in general, uh, like Kozilek, for example, the Great Distortion, he's pretty expensive. This would probably be pretty good in that deck as well. So I don't know, not an auto include, but really good in the decks that want it. Next up, we've got Discontinuity, which is three blue, blue, blue for an instant. As long as it's your turn, this spell costs two blue, blue less to cast and the turn. And I'm gonna read the reminder text just so we know what that means. It says, exile all spells and abilities from the stack, including this card. The player whose turn it is discards down to their maximum hand size, damage wears off, and this turn and until end of turn effects end. So there is a lot that can go into ending somebody's turn, especially because this is an instant. So if you are trying to stop somebody from comboing off on your turn, you can stop the turn, exile all spells on the stack for one and a blue. However, if you want to hold this up for mana for other people's turns, that is six mana that you have to hold up. I, I don't love that. I, I honestly would only use this card if I want to abuse it in my deck and not use it as interaction for, for other people's decks. However, I will say that ending the turn is a very powerful effect. And if, you, and if you have ways of being able to cast spells without paying their mana cost, then discontinuity might be the perfect card to interact with your opponents. Next up we have Fiery Emancipation. It is an enchantment that costs 3 red red red, and it reads, if a source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals triple that damage to that permanent or player instead. That is uh, quite the burn card right there. Um, I guess Wizards has decided that they really like the idea of doubling and tripling things lately, and they're just sticking it on all types of permanents. So I think that this card really doesn't have a ton of mechanical downside to playing it in a deck. Like any deck that is in red and is trying to win the game, this only helps that deck win the game. I mean, the whole point of commander is to deal damage to your opponents. This triples the speed of that process. I think the only downside to fire emancipation really is you become the arch enemy, right? Everybody is trying to get rid of fire emancipation. And if they can't get rid of fire emancipation, they're just going to try and get rid of you. Um, so I probably wouldn't put this in a deck unless I knew after casting it I could win the game shortly thereafter and I think the only way that you could really guarantee that is if you have a commander in the command zone that is effectively going to win the game because you will always have access to that commander so like cards like Heartless Hidasegu or uh, commanders that care about combat or are hasty um, basically commanders like that otherwise play it at your own discretion just be prepared for everybody to team up on you basically so um, maybe if you have like a huge board built up too and you kind of use this as like an overrun effect so you just cast this go to combat and then win the game right there that might work too but yeah i actually really do like fire emancipation it reminds me almost of a thousand year storm except in mono red and the way that Landon loves playing thousand year storm and what we tend to see with thousand year storm is is if it sticks around for one turn we know the next turn he is going to win that's kind of what i feel like with fire emancipation if you have a deck that is meant on building a deck that is meant to do combat damage especially if you're in red if this can stick around and you can untap with it you can win win the game with this very easily some some decks that i would put this in are brian the stout arm perforos the bronze blooded and perforos uh, original perforos uh torbrand and the cards that i would use to win with fire emancipation are things like comet storm uh chandra's ignition and even a gutter snipe if i wanted to just storm off with some some burn spells also let us know down in the comments how much damage you would deal to your opponents if you have fire emancipation and torbrand out and you cast a lightning bolt see if you can answer that question Next up, we've got Garuk Unleashed. For two green green, we have a four loyalty legendary planeswalker Garuk. He's back. He's dropped the black. Plus one, up to one target creature, gets plus three, plus three, and gains trample until end of turn. Minus two, create a three, three green beast creature token. Then if an opponent controls more creatures than you, put a loyalty counter on Garuk Unleashed. Minus seven, you get an emblem with at the beginning of your end step, you may search your library for a creature card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So the, the nice thing about Grook is you can somewhat protect himself by using his minus two. And if you have opponents with more creatures, then you can bump it up to a minus one instead. I think this can slot well in a deck where you're wanting to create tokens, whether you're playing a Tristani, a Gired, or Riss the Redeemed, then this potentially could slot in. I think there's better Garuks. So I don't think that group fits into every single green deck because if you're looking towards the ultimate, I would just recommend having a tooth and nail in your deck. Using a spell to get two creatures out onto the battlefield of your choosing from your deck is much better than trying to ultimate a Garuk in a deck where you're not trying to abuse either Proliferate or the tokens. I think if your deck has a way of accelerating his loyalty counters, like if you're in a Proliferate deck or like a Traxa or any other Proliferate deck, I think 
it's also like I think that's super powerful. I mean, it triggers on the end step, so you as soon as you get the emblem, like you're gonna get value off of it. Um, it's better than your upkeep because then you don't, you don't have to wait a whole turn cycle because uh, your opponents could probably try and kill you or mess up your board if you need like a specific piece. They can take out the piece that interacts with the piece you're going to search for in your library with Garouk. So I think that like if you can proliferate the counters or activate his loyalty super early, I think it's super worth playing. But honestly, if you like the card, put it in your green decks though because I mean, commander. Next up, we have Grim Tutor. It's a sorcery that costs one black black, and it reads, search your library for a card, put that card into your hand, then shuffle your library. You lose three life. So I have my storm count up to 20 with my thousand year storm. I cast Grim Tutor and I lose the game. Next. Grim Tutor isn't a new card. However, it's a very expensive reprint that we're very happy to see. And you guys should definitely pick up some standard boxes and get some of these for your commander deck because this is going to jump up in price very quickly next up we have liliana waker of the dead for two black black we have a four loyalty planeswalker plus one each player discards a card each opponent who can't loses three life minus three target creature gets minus x minus x until end of turn where x is the number of cards in your graveyard and a minus seven you get an emblem with at the beginning of combat on your turn put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control it gains haste i really like liliana this specific liliana then just marry her okay you have a plus one where if you're in a discard themed deck, you are getting advantage off of. And since you are probably either a discard or a graveyard deck, you are getting ahead in cards because you want to discard and you're making all of your opponents discard. Her minus three is removal, and that is super great, especially since we want to have a little bit of flexibility on our planeswalkers. And her minus seven is amazing if you can keep that around. The first thing I thought of was actually Tiny Bones from the Jumpstart spoilers where he incentivizes you to go around the discard strategy. So essentially Liliana just becomes each player discards a card, each player can't lose its real life, the beginning of your end step, draw a card. Super, super good. Next up, we have Mangara, the Diplomat. He is a legendary creature human cleric that costs three and a white. He is a legendary creature human cleric with lifelink. And he says, whenever an opponent attacks with creatures, if two or more of those creatures are attacking you and or planeswalkers you control, draw a card. Then he says, whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. He's also a two four. Yeah, this is a pretty good card draw in white, I suppose. Um, either your opponents are going to attack you with two creatures and you're going to draw a card or they're just gonna attack you with one creature and you won't draw any cards. I prefer my card draw to be consistent and reliable, but um, I think Wizards is going down the right track of giving white card draw without breaking the color pie, so I like it. How often do you think your three opponents will cast two spells on their turn? Do you think it's often? Do you think it's rare? I think, I think it's often. I think you should be building decks to cast more than one spell per turn. So if you're playing Mono White, are you going to play Mangara? If I'm playing Mono White, would I play him as the commander? No, no, just or in I, the 99. If I'm playing a Mono White deck, would I put Mangara in the deck? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Because think about it. It's like either you get card draw or your opponents don't attack you. In, in either case, you're staying in the game. Um, and like, even if they, even if you don't get the card draw off of them attacking you, like they're going to be casting two spells in a turn. Like, unless your opponents are playing bad decks and in the which case, like cool, like you probably don't need the card draw to beat their decks if they're trying to not cast two spells in a turn. So I, I, I really like Mangara. I do think it's a step in the right direction. I think if you're playing three colors, you can probably find a better alternative to Mangara for card draw. However, if, if you are playing a two color deck, that's not white green then this might be a, a good include for your card draw. It reminds me of kind of the twin to Alms Collector as the two pillars of white card draw. Yeah, well, like I said, I think if they continue to do this thing in white, where white does have card draw, but it's contingent upon like your opponents doing something or not doing something, I, I think that's perfect. That can be white's thing. It can be staxy drawy, like great. I think white decks or decks that are relying on white to be the card advantage are hanging so much on smothering tithe and mangara that like if either of those pieces get removed you don't want your deck to just be done so next up we have rin and seri inseparable the card that wizards literally made for me one red green white for a 4-4 legendary creature dog cat notice how it's dog cat whenever you cast a dog spell create a 1-1 green cat creature token whenever you cast a cat spell create a 1-1 one, one white dog creature token and then for nyan tap rin and seri inseparable deals damage to any target equal to the number of dogs you control you gain life equal to the number of cats you control 
So it's very interesting because Rin and Seri are one of the f one of the only twin tribal decks and the first tribal deck to feature both cats and dogs. If you're looking for a deck tech on Rin and Seri, there is one on our channel right now that we will go ahead and link in the show notes below. Go ahead and check that out for our thoughts on Rin Seri. Next up, we have Terror of the Peaks. It is a creature dragon that costs three red red. It has flying and it says spells your opponents cast that target Terror of the Peaks costs an additional three life to cast. Whenever another creature enters a battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. That's pretty cool, not gonna lie. It's a good dragon. Basically, any combo that is X and Impact Tremors, Warstorm Surge, or Perforos also include Terror of the Peaks in that combo. So if you have any ways of putting infinite creatures into play, you basically win the game if you have Terror of the Peaks out because it will deal that damage to any target. You can ping your opponents to death. I also like that this can deal damage to creatures. Um, that's one thing that I don't like about Impact Tremors or Perforos is that it's limited to just hitting players. Sometimes I'd rather have the damage hit creatures so that I can stay alive longer until the Impact Tremors or the Perforos can actually kill my opponents. And so I think that having this extra flexibility is probably worth Terror of the Peaks being a little bit easier to kill. Um, but I like this card. I think he's pretty cool. I don't have, I currently don't have any decks that I would consider putting it in because that's not really my style of play, but I'm excited to losing to this card in some of my friends' decks. So, all right, next up, we've got Teferi Master of Time. For two blue blue, we have a three loyalty planeswalker, a static ability. You may activate loyalty abilities of Teferi Master of Time on any player's turn anytime you can cast an instant. And yes, that does mean you can use his abilities every single turn, even your opponent's turns. So what does he do? Plus one, draw a card, then discard a card. Minus three, target creature you don't control phases out. Now what the heck is phasing out? Treat it and anything attached to it as though they don't exist until it's controller's next turn. Then minus 10, take two extra turns after this one. So I love this Teferi, especially in Commander, because you can use his abilities on any opponent's turn. So if you are just using his plus one, it only takes two turns to use his minus 10 to take two extra turns while still keeping them alive at one. Even if you don't, you can spend the first two of your opponent's turn to draw a card, then discard a card. And let's say your opponent attacks your Teferi with a flyer and you can just phase it out and protect your Teferi longer. It's super great in decks like Atraxa that proliferate. It's really good in stacks and pillow forts deck that include white because you're gonna be able to protect yourself while you continue to ferry up to its minus 10. No matter what option you choose, these are all things that you'd want to do anyway. So you can essentially pay four mana to draw a card and discard a card, such so as loot every single turn until your next turn. Or you can do a combination of phasing out and drawing and discarding card. I just really like this card and I, the, the minus 10 is something you can absolutely win off of. I think this is a super powerful Planeswalker that doesn't just go in, in Super Friends decks. All right, now onto the rares. Uh, we have Baron Tolarian Archmage. He is a human wizard that costs one blue blue. And he reads, when he enters the battlefield, you can return up to one other target creature or Planeswalker to its owner's hand. And at the beginning of your end step, if a permanent was put into your hand from the battlefield this turn, draw a card. I think Baron could be a pretty fun commander with lots of bouncy thingies, bouncing your opponent's things, bouncing your own things. Um, I, I pr probably prefer to have him in the 99. I am probably going to be rebuilding my Naban deck, which is Wizard Tribal. Um, Naban basically doubles all of your Wizard Enter the Battlefield triggers, so Baron is going to bounce two things, and then you get a draw card at the end of your turn. Uh, I don't know if it would have been too much to ask that instead of at the beginning of your end step, it said at the beginning of each end step, if a permanent was put into your hand from the battle for this turn, you could draw a card. I think that would have been probably pretty balanced, wouldn't you say? Like if you could draw a card on every turn cycle for bouncing something back to your hand. I don't know. I don't know if maybe that's like too much of a down or like too easy to do, but yeah, wizard tribal. That's all I have to say about that. Next up, we have Bashri's Lieutenant, which is a creature human knight that costs three and a white. He has vigilance and protection from multicolored. And when Bashri's Lieutenant enters the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. And whenever Bashri's Lieutenant or another creature you control dies, note that it doesn't say non-token creature. If it had a plus one plus one counter on it, you create a two two white knight creature token with vigilance. So basically, if you have any abilities on the field, static abilities to like put plus one plus one counters on creatures when they enter the battlefield or to get plus one plus one counters on creatures at any way at all, and you have a free sack outlet, you can basically go infinite. And if you have like a blood artist effect or a way of generating mana with like a Phyrexian altar and Ashnod's altar, you get infinite mana. If you have altar of dementia to sacrifice the creatures, you can mill your opponents out. 
So basically, you'll sacrifice the creature with a plus one plus one counter. Bashi will see it die and you'll get that white knight into play. And if you have like Cathar's Crusade or a Good Fortune Unicorn or a Grim Goalie, or basically any way of putting a plus one plus one counter on a creature when it enters a battlefield, you can just reset that and do that again and again and again, perpetually sacrificing that uh, creature token that Bashi makes for the value for whatever sacrifice piece you're using. So pretty cool, another infinite combo piece. Um, I, I might put it in my Tyam deck. The only problem is he costs four mana, so Tyam won't be able to reanimate it. But if your deck wants to make tokens and you're an aristocrat strategy anyways, and you're planning on sacrificing things for value, probably a pretty good include. Next up, we have Brash Taunter, which is four and red for a 1-1 one, one goblin with indestructible. Whenever Brash Taunter is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to target opponent. And for two and red and tap, Brash Taunter fights another target creature. You know, I actually really love this card. The fact that it's a rare made me think that there wouldn't be a way of using that ability on himself to deal damage to opponents, but he has a fight mechanic on himself, which means there is a lot of power to this card. You can use that as a, a control piece to stop your opponents from attacking you by holding it there and just being like, hey, if you swing at me with your 12-12 dragon, I'll fight it and deal 12 damage to you. Wait, or, you just block it. It has an indestructible. Well, if has flying. But, um, oh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you, you can block massive creatures that don't have trample. If they don't have trample, you can deal that much damage, and at the end of the turn, you can fight it to deal that much more damage to your opponent. Give him first strike and death touch. If you can give him first strike and death touch, that's that's a scary card. That's a very scary card. That's a very scary goblin. Other than that, I don't think it really fits well in Goblin Tribal because he's four and red. Uh, normally, want our Goblin Tribal decks to feature a lot of cheaper goblins but I don't think it would hurt to put it in here, but I do think this is, goes really good in decks that were meant to do combat, meant to try to fight. And I just want to point out that you can also fight your own creatures. So if you're in any deck that is focusing on combat, whether it be Xenagos, Perforos, Torbrand, then you can just use Brass Taunter to fight your own creatures and then deal that damage to your opponents. Next up, we have Conspicuous Snoop. It is a creature goblin rogue that costs red red, and he reads, play with the top card of your library revealed. And you may cast goblin spells from the top of your library. As long as the top card of your library is a goblin card, Conspicuous Snoop has all activated abilities of that card. This card has been pretty well talked about on all of the normal Magic the Gathering platforms and content creators. Uh, basically, this is going to be a super huge card in Modern and Legacy with turn 3 win, turn 4 wins, and I have seen people brewing some really weird Conspicuous Snoop CDH piles, which is kind of interesting. Basically, if you're not trying to use this as like a CDH win con, which I don't even think it's really that good in those formats anyways, you're really only playing this in like Cranko decks or Goblin Tribal decks. But I think it's really good in those Goblin Tribal decks. I've never really built one, but I can only imagine that being able to play goblins from the top of your library as though they're in your hand is pretty useful. So pretty good card advantage. Next up, we have Double Vision, which we're just continuing on this trend of slapping double dealing and tripling effects on permanent. So it's an enchantment that costs three red red. Whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Your eyes aren't playing tricks on you. I am. So I, in some situations, kind of like this a little bit more than Thousand Year Storm. And in other situations, I don't like it as much. Um, the cool thing is, it says whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn. So when the turn it comes out, you've paid five mana, it's possible that you have enough mana left over to cast an instant or sorcery spell. Great. The problem with, that I found with Thousand Year Storm is maybe I'm stupid and I cast it on curve or I tap out for it, or I cast it and I've got like two mana left and I've got like a one mana spell in my hand and a two mana spell in my hand. Uh, Thousand Year Storm doesn't copy the first spell. I have to get my storm count up. So Thousand Year Storm has like a much higher ceiling. Like I can go a lot higher with it, but like the turn it comes out, it's not as good as Double Vision. But I think Double Vision and Thousand Year Storm in conjunction together is kind of nutty. And I've actually been trying to rebuild my spell copy deck with Jaleva, the Scourge of Nephalia. And I think this card is actually pushing me to the limit of actually building the deck. Um, there are so many really cool like copying spells in red and blue. You've got Twin Cast, Double Cast, um, Fury Storm. They're just like the list goes on and on and on about like how many cool like bonus round. So many cool copy spells. And then we also got a Twinning Staff from uh, the, the most recent Commander set and Calamax, the, the Storm Sire. So there's like so much support right now for copying spells. Um, and I think that this, having this permanent 
like opens up the doors for a lot of things. So I am super excited about this card. I've, I'm picking up like several copies. So Joel Rael, one Vuli recluse is one on a green for a one, two legendary creature, human droid. She reads whenever you draw your second card each turn, create a two, two green cat creature token. And for four green green until end of turn, creatures you control have base power and toughness XX, where X is the number of cards in your hand. So it kind of gives us the vibe of Gavi Ness Warden from the, the most recent pre-cons, but only in mono green. But the reason I, I like Joriel probably better than Gavi is number one, she only costs two mana. And the number two, she has a way of using the creatures that she is bringing out. So in green, we have ways of drawing cards on our opponent's turns. Things like Heartwood Storyteller and Glade Muse can potentially draw us cards on our opponent's turns. You've also got artifacts and enchantments that you can, you know, use mana to tap to draw cards. Most likely, you're just going to be creating cats on your turn, but you still have an ability to use those cats with Joriel's second ability, especially if you're playing things like Parallel Lives and creating two tokens each turn and then finish your opponents off with a finale of Devastation into a Creator Hoof Behemoth. Next up, we have quite possibly the most powerful legendary creature from this set. It's breaking all of the charts and has climbed to the very top of the CDH meta. We have Karavik the Spiteful. He is a legendary creature human warlock that costs two black black and other creatures get minus one, minus one. I can literally hear Elish Norn shaking in her Praetor boots. So I've gone on record before and I'll say it again. Karavik is honestly, I think just a strictly better Elish Norn. Um, I think the fact that he can kill your creatures, whereas Elish Norn cannot kill your creatures, is super undervalued. Um, just imagine for this, you have a Grave Betrayal, a Grave Pact, a Dictative Erebos, a Blood Artist, 15 tokens, enough mana to cast Karavik. Um, you might win the game at that point. Next up, we have Liliana Standard Bearer. For two and a black, we have a 3-1 Zombie Knight with Flash. When Liliana Standard Bearer enters the battlefield, draw X cards where X is the number of creatures that died under your control this turn. There's a couple things I like about this card. Number one, it has Flash, so obviously we can use this on our opponent's turns. Maybe we're saving ourselves from a board wipe. The second thing is it does kind of remind me of a Midnight Reaper or a Grim Horror Specs, except it counts all creatures, which means all of the tokens that are dying, whether it be zombie tokens since it's a zombie knight, uh, whether it just be uh, tokens from Endrixar, any kind of creature that has died, you're going to get a benefit off of this. And the third thing that I like about Liliana Standard Bearer is that you can return it back to your hand and use this multiple times. Or if you're in a Marin deck and you can return this back to your hand and play it again, there's some really good value that you can get off of Liliana Standard Bearer. Next up, we have Peer Into the Abyss. It's a sorcery that costs four black, 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 and it reads target player draws cards equal to half the number of cards in their library and loses half their life round up each time i'm just gonna say the biggest downside to this card is having to sit there and wait for your opponents to count out half their library um that would take forever yeah i think that this card is you know absolutely terrifying in the nekuzar deck because just with nekuzar out and this this is most likely going to kill whichever opponent you target it at and if you have ways of recurring it or copying it with all the other copy spells in the set or all the other copy spells that exist this could potentially kill the table all at once with nekuzar i like the flexibility of this card the fact that you can target yourself if you need the card draw and you know the life at this point isn't a super big deal you can take out an opponent i think it's a super cool card Next up, we've got Pursued Whale. For 5 blue blue, we have an 8-8 eight, eight whale. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent creates a 1-1 one, one red pirate creature token with this creature camp block, and creatures you control attack each combat if able, and spells your opponent's cast that target Pursued Whale costs 3 more to cast. Every single set, we are inching closer and closer to a Leviathan Whale Serpent Tribal Deck. See monsters! Next up, we have Radha, Heart of Keld. She is a legendary creature elf warrior that costs one red and a green. And as long as it's your turn, Radha, Heart of Keld has first strike. And you may look at the top card of your library anytime, and you may play lands from the top of your library. She also has an activated ability that says four red and a green. Radha gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of lands you control. I think uh, in an elf tribal deck or a lands matter deck, she's pretty cool. Being able to play lands from the top of your library is super useful in a lot of different facets. Like if you've been drawing a ton of lands and you don't need any more, it's nice to get them off the top of your library. Or if like you've missed a land drop 
and like you drew something that you wanted to cast but you don't have enough mana and the land that you need is on top of your library that feels super good i also think it's super cool that she has really cool looking swords um i think that there's probably something to be said that legendary creatures that have cool swords are a lot stronger than legendary creatures that don't have cool swords um also she has uh, a win con stapled onto her where you can win with commander damage Next up, we have Sanctum of All, which is Wooburg for a legendary enchantment shrine. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may search your library and or graveyard for a shrine card and put it onto the battlefield. If you search your library this way, shuffle it. If an ability of another shrine you control triggers while you control six or more shrines, that ability triggers an additional time. I don't have very many opinions about this card, and neither does London. I am going to go ahead and summon Peter from the Netherworld to talk about this card, because I know he was very excited about it. I will tap all my lands and cast Peter. Yeah, Peter here. Um, I may or may not have brewed at least two decks with Sanctum of All. I'm a big fan of the, the original Shrine cycle, and this is a big upgrade to have six new cards, and one of them being kind of a, a tutor for all of those, oh, bringing Lord. it together. A, a, a Shrine Lord, if you will. Um, built the deck with Sisse as the commander, and um, I mean, it's... It's jank, it's slow, but it's a lot of fun to get all of these shrines out. <laughs> it gets Sanctum of All out on turn six. No. Planning on winning by turn 15. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you don't even win if you get Sanctum of All out. Yeah, so, the deck just. When you get all of your shrines, you have, like, super awesome, like, card draw and. It's basically some summoning Exodia. Damage. Some of them do damage. You can see your opponents, yeah. It's like basically it's summoning Exodia. More... <laughs> yeah basically you you get a lot of mana you get a lot of cards you, yeah i mean like it it's it was fun to to build i don't think i will ever actually play it but um but it's it's cool to see a, a tribe that was underrepresented in kamigawa continued to to build on itself even if this is the last time we ever see shrines again i'm happy next up we have see the truth which is a sorcery that costs one in the blue and it reads look at the top three cards of your library put one of those cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order but if this spell was cast from anywhere other than your hand put each of those cards into your hand instead so if you are in any type of elsha of the infinite where you can cast instance of sorceries from the top of your library or a Kess deck where you can cast them from your graveyard, or Jaleva where you can cast them from exile. Um, although, like, in any deck other than those, or any deck that can cast this anywhere from your hand, this is just a bad anticipate, um, and I'd rather just play anticipate. But if I'm in the deck that wants it, it's pretty good for two mana. Next up, we've got Subaru Tesla Dodge Caravan. For two and a red, we have a two, three legendary creature human shaman with haste. For one generic, another target creature with power two or less can't be blocked this turn. And for one or red, tap, discard your hand until end of turn whenever a creature you control with power two or less deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. This is a really interesting commander and I think there's actually a lot of potential with this. Uh, the fact that Subaru gives you the ability of making your creatures with power two or less unblockable while also giving an advantage off of them dealing damage, I think has a lot of potential. There are some cards that you can put in here like... Berserker's Onslaught that gives all of your creatures double strike. And the way that Subaru is worded, if your creature has double strike, it deals combat damage twice, which means there are two triggers off of the second ability of Subaru. Another card that goes really well in this deck is Bedlam, which is two red red for an enchantment that says creatures can't block. You don't even have to use her ability to make your creatures power two less unblockable. You also can put things like Torbrand or Fire Emancipation and just, just deal extra damage off of it. I do think there's a lot of potential with Subaru. Uh, for our audio listeners, the actual name of the card is Subira Tool ZD Caravaner. For all of our video listeners, you know what I'm calling it. Moving on, we have Sublime Epiphany. It is an instant that costs four blue blue. And it is modal, it says choose one or more. Counter target spell, counter target activated or triggered ability, return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, create a token that's a copy of target creature you control, and target player draws a card. So this is basically just going up the chain in sequential CMC from Cryptic Command to Mystic Confluence to Sublime Epiphany. We've got four, five, and six. And I would probably only play this in a deck that has ways of reducing the mana cost. I think there has to be like a, a pretty like specific and fringe scenario where you cast this spell and are able to choose all of the modes. I think most of the time you're probably going to be drawing a card, bouncing a permanent, and maybe making a copy of something. But I, I really like this card. I think the art is amazing. And sometimes I put bad cards into my deck because I think the art is pretty. I'm not saying that this card is bad, but the art 
I, I really like the art, so I'm probably going to put this in a lot of my blue decks. Next up, we have Teferi's Ageless Insight, which is two blue blue for an enchantment, legendary enchantment. If you would draw a card, except the first one you would draw in each of your draw steps, draw two cards instead. I would much prefer if it said you just draw two cards every time you draw a card. But it does double up all your draw spells. It's only a matter of time before Wizards prints a six mana enchantment or artifact that allows you to triple your Oh, we, we've got triple your draws. Like whenever you draw a card, you draw twice that many cards. Yes, but we're waiting for a triple. A triple card, triple card, triple. Next set. Anyways, if you're in a if you're in a deck that is drawing a lot of cards, uh, especially if you're in a deck that is drawing cards on your opponent's turns, then this card is very good. It's only four mana, and there's a lot of potential. I mean, just think if you have a consecrated sphinx, you're gonna draw. Yeah, you're gonna draw four cards every time your opponent draws a card. If you have a Ristic study, you'll draw two cards. If your opponents don't pay the one. There, there's a lot of potential for Teferi's Ageless Insight, but I don't think it's an auto-include in every blue deck. I think it is an auto-include in every blue deck. In every mono blue deck, at least. And finally, we have Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose. He is a legendary creature, Vampire Cleric, that costs two and a black. He reads, whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. And he has an activated ability that costs three black black, and it says creatures you control gain lifelink until the end of turn. We've done a deck tech on this guy already. Griffin built a super cool deck based around him. If you want to check out that video, we'll have a link for that. I will be playing this deck in our upcoming Duels of the Peaks episode, so make sure you watch that so you can see the deck in action if you're interested in building it and you want to see how it plays out first. I'll let Griffin's deck tech do a lot of the talking for this guy, but basically he's got some super cool like two card combos so with cards like exquisite blood or blood tribute you can do some crazy shenanigans killing everybody at once killing one person at once um some super cool shenanigans with extorts basically life gain and, and commander isn't super great because a lot of times your opponents can kill you faster than you can gain life but the fact that Vito turns your gaining life into opponents losing life thus getting you closer to winning the game is super cool and makes all those life gain spells that before weren't that great actually relevant i've said this before i love commanders like that that take a whole pile of irrelevant cards sitting in my binder and turn them into useful tools in a deck so i'm super excited to play Vito. so and with that this episode is coming to a close thank you guys so much for sticking around to this point we really appreciate all of your support if you like our content and you haven't subscribed yet make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our future set reviews we're going to be doing one for jumpstart and so you don't miss our deck decks that come out every monday and all of our gameplay videos where we're going to be featuring cards from the newest sets or just homebrews that we really like that is content that you definitely don't want to miss again thank you guys so much and i hope you guys have a great week thanks for listening guys we'll see you next time Also, what in that art is making him a cleric? He looks more like an advisor. I really feel like that's a flavor fail. He he should be an advisor. He's a, uh... Yeah, clerics are like healers or like religious. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. He... <laughs> okay. Why does he have lifelink? Why does he have lifelink? What, what is he doing in... He, he's got a paper and a... What's he gonna do? You owe me five life? Check. You owe me five life? Put a stamp on that, send it to whoever he sends letters to. Whatever. Jeez. Okay.